The Irish Sea separates the islands of Ireland and Great Britain. It is connected to the Celtic Sea in the south by St George's Channel, and to the Inner Seas off the west coast of Scotland in the north by the North Channel. Anglesey is the largest island within the Irish Sea, followed by the Isle of Man. The sea is occasionally, but rarely, referred to as the Manx Sea. The sea is of significant economic importance to regional trade, shipping and transport, fishing, and power generation in the form of wind power and nuclear plants. Annual traffic between Great Britain and Ireland amounts to over 12 million passengers and 17 million tons of traded goods. Origin and topography The Irish Sea has undergone a series of dramatic changes over the last 20,000 years as the last glacial period ended and was replaced by warmer conditions. At the height of the glaciation the central part of the modern sea was probably a long freshwater lake. As the ice retreated 10,000 years ago the lake reconnected to the sea, becoming brackish and then fully saline once again. The International Hydrographic Organization defines the limits of the Irish Sea as follows. On the north. The southern limit of the Scottish Seas, or inner seas off the west coast of Scotland, defined as a line joining the south extreme of the Mull of Galloway in Scotland and Ballantyne Point in Ireland. On the south. A line joining St David's Head to Carnesall Point. It is connected to the North Atlantic at both its northern and southern ends. To the north, the connection is through the North Channel between Scotland and Northern Ireland and the Malin Sea. The southern end is linked to the Atlantic through the St George's Channel between southeastern Ireland and Pembrokeshire in Wales, and the Celtic Sea. The Irish Sea is composed of a deeper channel about 300 km long and 30 Euro 50 km wide on its western side and shallower embayments to the east. The Western Channel's depth ranges from 80 metres up to 275 m in the Beaufort's Dyke in the North Channel. The main embayments are Euro Cardigan Bay in the south and the waters to the east of the Isle of Man a Euro are less than 50 m deep. The sea has a total water volume of 2,430 km 3, 80% of which is to the west of the Isle of Man, and a surface area of 47,000 km 2. The largest sand banks are the Bahama and King William Banks to the east and north of the Isle of Man and the Kish Bank, Codling Bank, Arklow Bank and Blackwater Bank near the coast of Ireland. The Irish Sea, at its greatest width, is 200 km and narrows to 75 km. Shipping, unlike Great Britain, Ireland has no tunnel or bridge connection to continental Europe. Thus the vast majority of heavy goods trade is done by sea. Northern Ireland ports handle 10 million tons of goods trade with Great Britain annually, while ports in the Republic of Ireland handle 7.6 million tons, representing 50% and 40% respectively of total trade by weight. The Port of Liverpool handles 32 million tons of cargo and 734,000 passengers a year. Holyhead Port handles most of the passenger traffic from Dublin and R. N. Lager ports as well as 3.3 million tons of freight. Ports in the Republic handle 3,600,000 travellers crossing the sea each year, amounting to 92% of all Irish sea travel. This has been steadily dropping for a number of years, probably as a result of low-cost airlines. Ferry connections from Great Britain to Ireland across the Irish Sea include the routes from Swansea to Cork, Fishguard and Pembroke to Rosselaire, Holyhead to Dar en Liger. Holyhead to Dublin, Cairn Ryan to Belfast and Larne to Cairn Ryan. There is also a connection between Liverpool and Belfast via the Isle of Man or direct from Birkenhead. The world's largest car ferry, Ulysses, is operated by Irish ferries on the Dublin Port Euro Holyhead route. Stainard Line also operates between Britain and Ireland. The Port of Barrow and Furness despite being one of Britain's largest shipbuilding centres and being home to the United Kingdom's only submarine building complex, is only a minor port. Irish Sea is also the name of one of the BBC's shipping forecast areas defined by the coordinates, 54 a degree 50 a euro squared n 05 a degree 05 a euro squared w, 54 a degree 45 a euro squared n 05 a degree 45 a euro squared w. 52 a degree 30 a euro squared no 6 a degree 15 a euro squared w 52 a degree 00 a euro squared no 5 a degree 05 a euro squared w 
during World War I. The Irish Sea became known as U-Boat Alley, because the U-Boats moved their emphasis from the Atlantic to the Irish Sea after the United States entered the war in 1917. See also, Transport in Ireland, Transport in the United Kingdom, Transport on the Isle of Man. Geography The Irish Sea has coasts on the Republic of Ireland, all four constituent countries of the United Kingdom, and the Isle of Man. Equals cities and towns equals, below is a list of cities and towns around the Irish Sea coasts in order of size. Equals islands equals, the Irish Sea lies between the islands of Ireland and Great Britain. Listed below are islands in the Irish Sea which are over one km squared in area, or which have a permanent population. Anglesey is almost attached to Holy Island. Holy Island is included separately. Environment equals biodiversity equals, the most accessible and possibly the greatest wildlife resource of the Irish Sea lies in its estuaries, particularly the Dee Estuary, the Mosey Estuary, the Ribble Estuary, Morecambe Bay, the Solway Firth, Loch Ryan, the Firth of Clyde, Belfast Loch, Strangewood Loch, Carlingford Loch, Dundalk Bay, Dublin Bay and Wexford Harbour. However, a lot of wildlife also depends on the cliffs, salt marshes and sand dunes of the adjoining shores, the seabed and the open sea itself. The information on the invertebrates of the seabed of the Irish Sea is rather patchy because it is difficult to survey such a large area, where underwater visibility is often poor and information often depends upon looking at material brought up from the seabed and mechanical grabs. However, the groupings of animals present depend to a large extent on whether the seabed is composed of rock, boulders, gravel, sand, mud or even peat. In the soft sediments seven types of community have been provisionally identified, variously dominated by brittle stars, sea urchins, worms, mussels, telins, furrow shells, and tower shells. Parts of the bed of the Irish Sea are very rich in wildlife. The seabed southwest of the Isle of Man is particularly noted for its rarities and diversity, as are the horse mussel beds of Strangewood Lock. Scallops and queen scallops are found in more gravelly areas. In the estuaries, where the bed is more sandy or muddy, the number of species is smaller but the size of their populations is larger. Brown shrimp, cockles and edible mussels support local fisheries in Morecambe Bay and the Dee estuary and the estuaries are also important as nurseries for flatfish, herring and sea bass. Muddy seabeds in deeper waters are home to populations of the Dublin Bay prawn, also known as scampi. The open sea is a complex habitat in its own right. It exists in three spatial dimensions and also varies over time and tide. For example, where fresh water flows into the Irish Sea in river estuaries its influence can extend far offshore as the fresh water is lighter and floats on top of the much larger body of salt water until wind and temperature changes mix it in. Similarly, Warmer water is less dense and seawater warmed in the intertidal zone may float on the colder offshore water. The amount of light penetrating the seawater also varies with depth and turbidity. This leads to differing populations of plankton in different parts of the sea and varying communities of animals that feed on these populations. However, increasing seasonal storminess leads to greater mixing of water and tends to break down these divisions which are more apparent when the weather is calm for long periods. Plankton includes bacteria, plants and animals that drift in the sea. Most are microscopic, but some, such as the various species of jellyfish and sea gooseberry, can be much bigger. Diatoms and dinoflagellates dominate the phytoplankton. Although they are microscopic plants, diatoms have hard shells and dinoflagellates have little tails that propel them through the water. Phytoplankton populations in the Irish Sea have a spring bloom every April and May, when the seawater is generally at its greenest. Crustaceans, especially copepods, dominate the zooplankton. However, many animals of the seabed, the open sea and the seashore spend their juvenile stages as part of the zooplankton. The whole plankton soup is vitally important, directly or indirectly, as a food source for most species in the Irish Sea even the largest. The enormous basking shark, for example, lives entirely on plankton and the leatherback turtle's main food is jellyfish. 
the colossal diversity of invertebrate species live in the Irish Sea and its surrounding coastline, ranging from flower-like fan worms to predatory swimming crabs to large chameleon-like cuttlefish. Some of the most significant for other wildlife are the reef-building species like the inshore horse mussel of Strangewood Lock and the intertidal honeycomb worm of Morecambe Bay, Cumbria and Lancashire. These build up large structures over many years and, in turn, provide surfaces, nooks and crannies where other marine animals and plants may become established and live out some or all of their lives. There are quite regular records of live and stranded leatherback turtle in and around the Irish Sea. This species travels north to the waters off the British Isles every year following the swarms of jellyfish that form its prey. Loggerhead turtle, Ridley sea turtle and green turtle are found very occasionally in the Irish Sea but are generally unwell or dead when discovered. They have strayed or been swept out of their natural range further south into colder waters. The estuaries of the Irish Sea are of international importance for birds. They are vital feeding grounds on migration flyways for shorebirds traveling between the Arctic and Africa. Others depend on the milder climate as a refuge when continental Europe is in the grip of winter. Twenty-one species of seabird are reported as regularly nesting on beaches or cliffs around the Irish Sea. Huge populations of the sea duck, common scotter, spend winters feeding in shallow waters off eastern Ireland, Lancashire and North Wales. Wales, dolphins and porpoises all frequent the Irish Sea, but knowledge of how many there may be and where they go is somewhat sketchy. About a dozen species have been recorded since 1980, but only three are seen fairly often. These are the harbour porpoise, bottle-nosed dolphin and common dolphin. The more rarely seen species are mink whale, fin whale, seri whale, humpback whale, North Atlantic right whales which are now considered to be almost extinct in eastern North Atlantic, sperm whale, northern bottle-nosed whale, long fin pilot whale, orca, white-beaked dolphin, striped dolphin and rissos dolphin. In 2005, a plan to reintroduce grey whales by airlifting 50 of them from the Pacific Ocean to the Irish Sea was claimed to be logically and ethically feasible. It had not been implemented by 2013. The common or harbour seal and the grey seal are both resident in the Irish Sea. Common seals breed in Strangewood Lock, grey seals in southwest Wales and, in small numbers, on the Isle of Man. Grey seals haul out, but do not breed, off Hilbury and Walney Islands, Merseyside, the Wirral, St. Anne's, Barrow and Furness Borough, and Cumbria. Equals radioactivity equals, the Irish Sea has been described by Greenpeace as the most radioactively contaminated sea in the world with some 8 million litres of nuclear waste discharged into it each day from Sellafield reprocessing plants, contaminating seawater, sediments and marine life. Low-level radioactive waste has been discharged into the Irish Sea as part of operations at Sellafield since 1952. The rate of discharge began to accelerate in the mid to late 1960s, reaching a peak in the 1970s and generally declining significantly since then. As an example of this profile, discharges of plutonium peaked in 1973 at 2,755 terabecquerels falling to 8.1 TBQ by 2004. Improvements in the treatment of waste in 1985 and 1994 resulted in further reductions in radioactive waste discharge although the subsequent processing of a backlog resulted in increased discharges of certain types of radioactive waste. Discharges of technetium in particular rose from 6.1 TBQ in 1993 to a peak of 192 TBQ in 1995 before dropping back to 14 TBQ in 2004. In total 22 petabecquerels of 241 poo was discharged over the period 1952-1998. Current rates of discharge for many radionuclides are at least 100 times lower than they were in the 1970s. Analysis of the distribution of radioactive contamination after discharge reveals the mean sea currents result in much of the more soluble elements such as cesium being flushed out of the Irish Sea through the North Channel about a year after discharge. Measurements of technetium concentrations post-1994 has produced estimated transit times to the North Channel of around six months with peak concentrations off the northeast Irish coast occurring 18 a euro 24 months after peak discharge. 
less soluble elements such as plutonium are subject to much slower redistribution. Whilst concentrations have declined in line with the reduction in discharges they are markedly higher in the eastern Irish Sea compared to the western areas. The dispersal of these elements is closely associated with sediment activity, with muddy deposits on the seabed acting as sinks, soaking up an estimated 200 kg of plutonium. The highest concentration is found in the eastern Irish Sea in sediment banks lying parallel to the Cumbrian coast. This area acts as a significant source of wider contamination as radionuclides are dissolved once again. Studies have revealed that 80% of current seawater contamination by cesium is sourced from sediment banks, whilst plutonium levels in the western sediment banks between the Isle of Man and the Irish coast are being maintained by contamination redistributed from the eastern sediment banks. The consumption of seafood harvested from the Irish Sea is the main pathway for exposure of humans to radioactivity. The Environmental Monitoring Report for the period 2003-2005 published by the Radiological Protection Institute of Ireland reported that in 2005 average quantities of radioactive contamination found in seafood ranged from less than 1 becquerel per kilogram for fish to under 44 becquerels per kilogram for mussels. Doses of man-made radioactivity received by the heaviest consumers of seafood in Ireland in 2005 was 1.10 a micron civet. This compares with the corresponding dosage of radioactivity naturally occurring in the seafood consumed by this group of 148 a micron civet and a total average dosage in Ireland from all sources of 3,620 a micron civet. In terms of risk to this group, Heavy consumption of seafood generates a 1 in 18 million chance of causing cancer. The general risk of contracting cancer in Ireland is 1 in 522. In the UK, the heavier seafood consumers in Cumbria received a radioactive dosage attributable to cellar field discharges of 220 a micron civet in 2005. This compares to average annual dose of naturally sourced radiation received in the UK of 2,230 a micron civet. Oil and gas exploration. Equals East Irish Sea Basin equals, with 210 billion cubic meters of natural gas and 176 million barrels of petroleum estimated by the field operators as initially recoverable hydrocarbon reserves from eight producing fields, the East Irish Sea Basin is at a mature exploration phase. Early Nemurian basinal mudstones are the source rocks for these hydrocarbons. Production from all fields is from fault-bounded traps of the lower Triassic formation, principally the Aeolian Sherwood sandstone reservoir, top sealed by younger Triassic continental mudstones and deviporites. Future mineral exploration will initially concentrate on extending this play, but there remains largely untested potential also for gas and oil within widespread carboniferous fluvial sandstone reservoirs. This play requires intraformational mudstone seal units to be present, as there is no top seal for reservoirs subcropping the regional base Permian unconformity in the east of the basin, and carboniferous strata crop out at the seabed in the west. Equals Carnarfon Bay Basin equals the Carnarfon Bay Basin contains up to 7 cubic kilometers of Permian and Triassic in rift sediments in an asymmetrical graben that is bounded to the north and south by lower Paleozoic massifs. Only two exploration wells have been drilled so far, and there remain numerous undrilled targets in tilted fault block plays. As in the East Irish Sea Basin, the principal target reservoir is the Lower Triassic, Sherwood Sandstone top sealed by younger Triassic mudstones and deviporites. Wells in the Irish sector to the west have demonstrated that pre-rift, Westphalian cold measures are excellent hydrocarbon source rocks, and are at peak maturity for gas generation. Seismic profiles clearly image these strata continuing beneath a basal Permian unconformity into at least the western part of the Carnarfon Bay Basin. The timing of gas generation presents the greatest exploration risk. Maximum burial of, and primary gas migration from, the source rocks could have terminated as early as the Jurassic, whereas many of the tilted fault blocks were reactivated or created during Paleogen inversion of the basin. However, it is also possible that a secondary gas charge occurred during regional heating associated with intrusion of Paleogen dikes, such as those that crop out nearby on the coastline of North Wales. 
have invoked this second phase of palaeogen hydrocarbon generation as an important factor in the charging of the East Irish Sea Basin's oil and gas fields. It is not clear as yet whether aeromagnetic anomalies in the southeast of Carnarfon Bay are imaging a continuation of the dike swarm into this area too, or whether they are instead associated with deeply buried Permians in rift volcanics. Alternatively, the fault block traps could have been recharged by exolution of methane from formation brines as a direct result of the tertiary uplift. Equals the Cardigan Bay Basin equals, the Cardigan Bay Basin forms a continuation into British waters of Ireland's North Celtic Sea Basin, which has two producing gas fields. The basin comprises a southeasterly deepening half graben near the Welsh coastline, although its internal structure becomes increasingly complex towards the southwest. Permian to Triassic, sin rift sediments within the basin are less than 3 km thick and are overlain by up to 4 km of Jurassic strata, and locally also by up to 2 km of Paleogen flaviodialtaic sediments. The basin has a proven petroleum system, with potentially producible gas reserves at the Dragon Discovery near the UK ROI median line, and oil shows in a further three wells. The Cardigan Bay Basin contains multiple reservoir targets, which include the Lower Triassic, Middle Jurassic Shallow Marine Sandstones and Limestone, and Upper Jurassic Fluvial Sandstone, the reservoir for the Dragon Discovery. The most likely hydrocarbon source rocks are early Jurassic Marine Mudstones. These are fully mature for oil generation in the west of the British sector, and are mature for gas generation nearby in the Irish sector. Gas prone. Westphalian pre-rift cold measures may also be present at depth locally. The Cardigan Bay Basin was subjected to two tertiary phases of compressive uplift, whereas maximum burial that terminated primary hydrocarbon generation was probably around the end of the Cretaceous, or earlier of Cretaceous strata, now missing, were never deposited in the basin. Despite the tertiary structuration, the Dragon discovery has proved that potentially commercial volumes of hydrocarbons were retained at least locally in Cardigan Bay. In addition to undrilled structural traps, the basin contains untested potential for stratigraphic entrapment of hydrocarbons near some sedimentary faults, especially in the Middle Jurassic section. Equals Liverpool Bay equals, the Liverpool Bay development is BHP Billiton Petroleum's largest operated asset. It comprises the integrated development of five offshore oil and gas fields in the Irish Sea, Douglas Oil Field, Hamilton Gas Field, Hamilton North Gas Field, Hamilton East Gas Field, Lennox Oil and Gas Field. Oil is produced from the Lennox and Douglas fields. It is then treated at the Douglas complex and piped 17 km to an oil storage barge ready for export by tankers. Gas is produced from the Hamilton. Hamilton North and Hamilton East Reservoirs. After initial processing at the Douglas Complex the gas is piped by subsea pipeline to the point of air gas terminal for further processing. The gas is then sent by onshore pipeline to Power Gen's combined cycle gas turbine power station at Connors Quay. Power Gen is the sole purchaser of gas from the Liverpool Bay development. The Liverpool Bay development comprises four offshore platforms. Offshore storage and loading facilities. The onshore gas processing terminal at Point of Air. Production first started at each filed as follows Hamilton North in 1995, Hamilton in 1996, Douglas in 1996, Lennox in 1996, and Hamilton East 2001. The first contract gas sales were in 1996. The quality of the water in Liverpool Bay was historically contaminated by demoing of sewage sludge at sea but this practice became illegal in December 1988 and no further sludge was deposited after that date. Equals Dorky Island Exploration Prospect equals, previous exploration drilling in the Kish Bank Basin has confirmed the potential for petroleum generation with oil shows seen in a number of wells together with natural hydrocarbon seeps recorded from airborne surveys. New analysis of vintage 2D seismic data has revealed the presence of a large undrilled structural closure at lower Triassic levels situated about 10 km offshore Dublin. This feature, known as the Dorky Island Exploration Prospect, may be prospective for oil, as there are prolific oil productive lower Triassic reservoirs nearby in the eastern Irish Sea offshore Liverpool. 
whilst the Dorky Island exploration prospect could contain about 870 million barrels of oil in place, this undrilled prospect still has significant risk and the partners are currently advancing a focused work program in order to better understand and hopefully mitigate these risks. However, given its location in shallow water and close proximity to shore, the prospect is of great interest as exploration drilling, together with any future development costs, are likely to be low. Proposed Tunnel Projects Discussions of linking Britain to Ireland began in 1895, with an application for a £15,000 towards the cost of carrying out borings and soundings in the North Channel to see if a tunnel between Ireland and Scotland was viable. Sixty years later Harford Montgomery Hyde, Unionist MP for North Belfast, called for the building of such a tunnel. The tunnel project has been discussed several times in the Irish Parliament. The idea for such a 34-kilometre-long rail bridge or tunnel, continues to be mooted. Several potential Irish sea tunnel projects have been proposed, including one between Dublin and Holyhead put forward in 1997 by the British engineering firm Simmons. At 80 kilometres, it would be by far the longest in the world, and would cost an estimated a 20 billion. Wind power An offshore wind farm was developed on the Arklow Bank, Arklow Bank Wind Park, about 10 kilometres off the coast of County Wicklow in the South Irish Sea. The site currently has seven G 3.6 MW turbines, each with 104 metre diameter rotors, the world's first commercial application of offshore wind turbines over 3 MW in size. The operating company, Airtricity, has indefinite plans for nearly 100 further turbines on the site. Further wind turbine sites include the North Hoyle site, 8 km off the coast from Ryle and Pre Statin in North Wales containing 32 MW turbines operated by NPOWE Renewables, Burbo Bank site 10 km off the North Wirral coast, Robin Rig Wind Farm in the Solway Firth, 30 90 m 3 MW turbines are operating in a wind farm 7 km the coast of Walney Island. Turbines are being erected off the coast of Clowhead. In fiction, in fiction, the Island of Soda, a fictional island from Wilbert Audrey's The Railway Series and the Thomas and Friends children's TV show, is located in the middle of the Irish Sea. See also, List of Crossings of the Irish Sea. References equals Bibliography equals External links, Build a Coast Marine Life Project, Irish Sea Conservation Zones, The Wildlife Trust's Living Seas a Euro Irish Sea.